So now I want to talk about doing a Laplace transform example, but this time using sort of a second order system that's going to have real roots. And just to kind of look at what kind of behavior and just how I might approach this. So imagine I have a differential equation that comes out here. This may have come from some particular circuit or related kind of structure. And I'm definitely putting in the tau because that would probably be representative towards some time constant, usually something squared, something linear, core term, and then I'd have my, my input there. So we would look at this particular structure and we would say, ah, okay, I can come up with this. So with a little bit, I can actually build this into a, into a bunch of factors in the denominator, all good. And then I'm going to find out this gives me a ratio, or basically going to be a polynomial that is a factor of two things, s tau plus 2 and s tau plus 1. You think, this is great. Uh, so now we have a pretty straightforward structure to work from. And it's in a form that we can start to do different things in terms of various inputs. So imagine I have an input here. Maybe this is you know a, a 1 volt step from 0 to 1 going into a particular circuit. Could be a number of things. Again, this is a heavy side transfer function side function, so therefore it's just a step that will go from 0 to 1. Great. And so after that, what I'm going to get is then a transform that's going to be 1 over s. So my output, my v of s, which is my state variable in this particular case, is going to give me this various three terms in s. And you think, this is great, so it gives me a sense of what I should be expecting to see out of this. Uh, in fact, you could probably look at this and go, hmm, well, what would my you know, what do I expect is my steady state just from this structure? Well, I could actually expect that I would multiply through the s's and then take the s as it goes to zero, and I'm actually going to expect a steady state that should be a half. This is interesting. It's worth kind of keeping in mind. It's also true that right, the, right after the step occurs, I'm going to expect that v of s is still going to actually be zero. You can see that, again, when you take multiply through by s, it gets rid of that, and you look at the s, as it goes to infinity, I'm going to get zero. So this gives you kind of a rough feel of what you're looking for here. So all of this works. Now, again, also, I assume that as I'm looking at the differential equation, that there are nothing to worry about in terms of the initial conditions. So we're just kind of going to directly work with the transfer function. Now, there are times when those initial conditions matter, and but just kind of keeping it simple at this point. So here's the transfer function I get at that point. I can take this and I can then bring this into, th into a fractions. Now, now I need to do a partial fraction expansion, A, B, and C, and I just kind of wanted to explain this out um, the way you would do that, right? Because then you have to take this and this and make these are equal. There's a couple different ways that you can solve that, one of which is to look for a particular A, multiply through by S tau plus 2, which then, of course, gets rid of that term here, this term here, um, these good, and then make it equal when s tau equals to minus 2 and then just solve, which means that these two terms go away and I should get a straightforward solution. And continue proceeding along those ways. If you do so, what you end up finding for v sub s is that you get sort of interesting coefficients as we simplify. Now I put this now into 1 over s of 2 over tau. When I have the tau over s tau plus 2 and the tau over s tau plus 1, it actually becomes very easy to transform it down to this form, knowing that these are likely the variables I'm going to need, I just kind of put them in there initially, normalizing what my A and B variables are likely to be. And, and so with intuition, you can do that. Well, once I have this structure, it's very easy to transform it because it then gives me a few terms. It gives me a 1, it gives me a e to the minus 2t over tau, and a minus tau, t over tau. And that all multiplied by u of t, because right, everything starts when t equals 0 which is interesting because the steady state, which is basically means when these t's go to zero so these exponentials disappear, is just simply a half. So everything is consistent is what you would expect to see in the solution. Oh, great. So this, this definitely gives me a very interesting response. And by the way, I could then do this where I have not just a u of t, but a dying exponential into this. And that exponential would also show up into these exponential terms. Remember with a linear system, the complex, any complex exponential term finds its way back into the solution at least by some level or some coefficient. Maybe a nearly zero, but it's usually always going to be there as they're basically eigenfunctions of the system, which is why we're doing Laplace transforms with typically, you know, with having that allows for the whole complex structure. 
Now, an interesting case is if I'm saying I'm looking for a steady state solution. Now, for typically the steps and so forth, this gives me the kind of trajectory towards it. But if I'm putting in a constant sine wave, I might just want to say, what is the output steady state solution? So imagine I have an input that's been continuously at sine omega t, so it's at one frequency, amplitude one, amplitude one volt, and I want to understand how that works for this particular structure. Well, at that point now, I can start asking a bunch of other questions. I could either use the factorized form or the non-factorized form. But I'm basically going to then put in j omega straight into the, for the s variables, because I know that there is no sigma, there's nothing where I'm converging to a steady state, I'm just looking at the result in steady state sine wave. I know it's also at omega t, so the only part of this sort of transformation that matters is at omega, uh, technically plus and minus omega if I'm being careful. And what I'm finding here is that I can then get a transfer function of what am I going to see, which is then going to basically be a complex number that says what is the shift in amplitude and the shift in phase. And that's what I get here. Now by taking this structure and then realizing, okay, now I can look for the magnitude of it. It gives me this particular term, actually this term, uh, this would be the squared term. Actually, I would take the square root of this to actually get the actual magnitude. And then when I look at the other term, I get the phase term on the other side here, which then gives me this over, over that remaining term that is squared. And so this gives me a way to kind of look at both magnitude and phase. So what's really cool is that, you know, although this becomes, say, maybe just a second order differential equation or a third or a fourth, the same procedure just continues to work through any sort of linear differential equation system I might have.